This is a hunt across the Mongolian steppe where it veers towards the Soviet border. But it's not anything living that we are pursuing today. Our search is for one of the undiscovered killing grounds of the 20th century. The hunt ends in a valley of bones. These are the skulls of massacre victims, all of them Buddhist lamas, as monks were called in Mongolia. Fifty years ago, on a dusty morning in Ulaanbaatar, the Mongolian capital, the communist despot who ordered these killings sped to a cabinet meeting. His name was Choibalsan. He terrorized this nation for 17 years. Comrade Marshal Choibalsan, though totally unknown in the West, was the Pol Pot of his time. He liquidated one of Asia's fabulous religions, destroying or emptying 700 monasteries, killing up to 100,000 people. Choibalsan had them all murdered, shot through the head. The legacy today of this protege of Stalin is a nation haunted by its past. Though their country is shackled by the burden of modern treachery on a Shakespearean scale, half of Mongolia's two million people thrive in exactly the same sort of semi-nomadic style as their forebears. It's still true that only the fittest survive, but the Mongols have adapted wonderfully to the hardships of the grasslands. There are two million horses wandering the Mongolian steppe, which is as large as the whole of Western Europe. To these rugged people, there is but one national hero. He was called Genghis Khan. Seven centuries ago, this obscure chieftain united the Mongols and led them to world domination, which is celebrated in this new Mongolian feature film. The mighty Khan and his descendants conquered both China and Russia. Their cruel and fearless horse warriors who reached the gates of Vienna aroused the same sort of fear as nuclear weapons in our own time. But then history tired of the Mongols' martial antics and forgot them. Today, Genghis Khan's capital, Karakoram, is a melancholy place. It's hard to believe that this drab community once inspired the Golden Horde, whose monuments were severed heads and ruined cities. As Mongol power shriveled, so China moved in. For four centuries, Mongolia was under the dragon throne's harsh control. The Mongols were assigned a familiar role as the prisoners of their own geopolitical fate, pinioned between Imperial Russia and China to the south. In the first years of the 20th century, Mongolia was at rock bottom. Poverty-stricken, racked by universal syphilis, exploited both by China and the Mongols' own corrupt Buddhist lamas and aristocracy.
revolution came to Mongolia as China itself began to implode. In 1921, in a war that saw one of the world's last cavalry charges, the Moscow Bolsheviks intervened. The Red Army was sent to Mongolia. The Bolsheviks placed a handful of Mongol radicals in power. In the shadow of Moscow, this became Asia's first communist state. The novice Marxists who invaded bound themselves ever closer to the newly formed Soviet Union, turning their back on a chaotic China and a predatory Japan. If you look at the map, uh, you see that Mon Mongolia is almost entirely isolated from the world. It has China on the south, it has the Soviet Union on the north. Uh, at the time we're talking about, China was hostile, the Japanese were an aggressive nation, were probing into Mongolia uh, militarily. The only friend they had uh, was the Soviet Union. Today, the capital bears a name resonant with revolutionary fervor, Ulan Bata, which means Red Hero. For decades, this was the 16th Republic of the Soviet Union in all but name. Ulan Bata was the most servile of Moscow's allies. Just as dutifully, it followed the Soviet lead when the moment came for political change. Encouraged by the Gorbachev reforms, Mongolia's democracy activists came out of the woodwork early last year. Demonstrating in the paralyzing cold of midwinter, they called for the end of the old order. Gradually, in the months that followed, the Revolutionary Party made a series of concessions that in theory mark the end of its supremacy. Recently, it recast itself as the Mongolian People's Party. Stalin, who had manipulated Mongolian politics for his own sinister aims, made an inglorious exit from his pedestal in Ulaanbaatar, an event that took place late at night because the ruling party hoped to minimize the fuss. Mongolia's communists had ruled from behind closed doors. Our search began in room 29 at the Interior Ministry, in other words, the secret police. We're the first Westerners allowed to see these archives of the firing squads and the gulags of the Choibalsan tyranny, thousands of files in numbered racks. Most Mongol families lost at least one relative during that terror. But it's only now, 50 years later, that the Mongols themselves are allowed limited access to learn where and when their loved ones were put to death. It's reckoned that one-tenth of the population of this country perished on the homicidal orders of Stalin and Choibalsan. These are files on 17,000 murdered lamas. Over 40,000 were executed when the ruling Revolutionary Party set out to liquidate its great ideological rival, the Lamist faith. They died in 1937 and 38. Many were killed on the orders of Stalin's secret police, the NKVD. This document shows Russian instructions written in the corner overruling orders issued by Mongolia's security service. <laughs> 